I want to move right at the beginning to a couple of thank yous. And in order to do this, I need some, some scouts to do something. They're going to bring me something that I need for this. comes the torch relay. Thank you. The scouts are here not just for that purpose but for another uh, part of it. I'm holding today the the torch that was presented to the city of Coquitlam by the folks that organized the torch relay um, uh, for the entire torch relay. And I just want to, I want to use this a little bit as a, a, as a prop related to uh, some thank yous that we really have to make. Council has asked me to extend our deep thank you to all those people who were involved in the most successful, the largest event in Coquitlam's history that took place on Thursday morning. I know many of you were there. Uh, it certainly was an amazing event for someone who's lived all his life in Coquitlam. I've never seen an event like that. It was down at Mackin Park. We had about, uh, my estimate would be 12,000 people uh, assembled to celebrate the torch, the arrival of the torch, and many thousands more all along the route. And I thank all those that came out to celebrate with us, all those that helped organize it. We have two, com two committees, the Torch Relay Task Group and the Spirit Committee both of whom worked tirelessly to make sure that this was a success. We have lots of Coquitlam City staff and uh, firefighters and police and volunteers that, that really put in uh, heart and soul into this uh, amazing event and uh, brought out what I think was the best in Coquitlam as we had the most multicultural, most diverse and most incredible uh, celebration. Uh, I recognize a couple of the, uh, the staff persons here today, particularly Wendy, I'll point her out only because she's trying to shrink behind someone. Um, thank you all. This was an absolutely amazing event. I also want to say gung hee fat choy, happy new Lunar New Year to those uh, who in our community who celebrate that. Mr. Kirk. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the first item this evening is a presentation by Mr. Don Cummings. It concerns Heritage Week, and we have an introduction by the city manager, Mr. Peter Steblin. You know, this really is a very, very good week. Uh, not only do we get to witness uh, all sorts of future athletes passing torches up, uh, but we get to witness uh, the current day athletes who are giving us their very, very best, of which we're all proud of uh, as part of the Olympics. But also, uh, this is Heritage Week for sport and recreation. And uh, this is an appropriate time just to take a moment to honor our history and to honor those who have given us a, f a firm foundation on which to uh, build the future. Because uh, one of the uh, things that I like to always talk about it is that it's only by standing on the shoulders of those who have come before that we can attain the heights that we achieve today. And uh, with us today is one of those uh, who have helped create our history. And to some, he would think that he's a historian. He himself refers to himself as a pterodactyl, if you would uh, believe that. Uh, but I would like to uh, ask Don Cunnings, who was our former uh, GM of Parks and Rec for many, many years in Coquitlam, uh, to come forward and give a bit of a presentation. I've asked Don to focus on history and focus on our heritage and try to pull out some of those memories uh, that have, has built the community. And, and uh, we thought that uh, this being Heritage Week would be an appropriate time for him to just give you a little snippet of the work that he's been doing. So over to you, Don. Thank you, Peter, Your Worship, members of council. It's indeed a pleasure uh, to be back before you. Uh, certainly uh, with the Olympics on, uh, and history has everything to do with time. And tonight I'd like you to think about time as a threefold present. The past is a present memory, the now is a present reality, and the future is a present expectation. And Peter has given me the Herculean task of talking about a half a century of athletics and athletic facilities in seven minutes. 
which in itself uh, qualifies as an Olympic event for this pterodactyl, I'll tell you. So let's get underway. The decade 1910-1920, a very busy decade in British Columbia's history and in Coquitlam's history. Uh, a cadre of gentlemen uh, back in 1910 in Vancouver got together and formed a limited company and went out and purchased a 200-acre sheep farm on Austin Avenue, uh, known as the Austin Sheep Farm. They pay $200 an acre for that farm, and this year is their centennial year, 100 years that the Coquitlam Golf and Country Club, is what they call themselves back then, uh, was formed. And you'll hear a lot about them over the years, so I'm just gonna let the slides speak for themselves. The Austin Farmhouse, uh, after which the Austin Avenue was named, uh, served as a clubhouse for the, and there was many clubhouses to follow. But the real interesting transportation story when we talk about it, light rapid transit coming to Coquitlam at some point, uh, they lucked out with a very serendipitous thing. The, the BC Electric tram on the Burnaby Lake line came perilously close to the Lougheed Mall. And the last stop, or the penultimate stop, the one before the end uh, of the line, uh, was called the Golf Club Station. And the patrons from Vancouver of that golf club would get out of that tram uh, and load themselves into this Democrat horse-drawn carriage and beat their way up the Austin Hill Trail uh, to the Vancouver Golf Club. An interesting trip. So that's what the aristocracy was doing. Down at the river, uh, a different group of people, uh, the proletariat, were winning hockey championships in Fraser Mills. And here we have in 1913-14 season, the Circle F Fraser Mills hockey team winning the Koi Cup, emblematic of the provincial hockey championships. And in the back right corner is Mr. Henry Mackin, for which Mackin Park, your worship that you just spoke of, was named after. And where did they play? That was a polemical question. Well, they played their hockey in the largest artificial ice rink in the world at that time the Denman Arena at 1805 Georgia Street, Denman and Georgia, uh, the home of the, Pen or the, the Vancouver Millionaires with their big V, uh, who won the Stanley Cup in 1915 against the Ottawa Senators. So they were, th this facility built in 1910 housed 10,500 patrons, and that's unbelievable. And in today's map, you can see Lost Lagoon, and the arrow shows where the uh, Denman Arena was located uh, before it burned down in 36. The teams from Fraser Mills would have got on a tram like that right in Fraser Mills. Uh, just think we had late rapid transit partially into Coquitlam 100 years ago. Uh, and we'd get on that tram, and in 40 minutes, they'd be at the Denman Arena front door by streetcar. And the, now turning to the decade of the 20s and 30s. This was the, the decade where penal institutions were being built. This is the Boys Industrial School, BISCO was the acronym, uh, on the Essendale grounds. Oops, we can lock ourselves out of here. And in that building was Coquitlam's first indoor swimming pool. So Chimu Pool was not the first pool in 71, but the first pool was in 1927. And guess who the contractor was? His name was Wingrove, who was Trevor Wingrove's grandfather. Who My in goodness. 1926, the newspaper in Port Coquitlam speaks of uh, contractor Wingrove taking the boys down and removing gravel for the pool tank from the Coquitlam River. Upstairs in this, pool was a remarkably well-equipped gymnasium, three-quarter size facility, something that the normal population or general population of Coquitlam had to wait almost a decade or a century uh, to achieve. The 1930s and 40s was a busy decade, and it was a decade where nobody had any money. It was the dirty 30s. And to get a job, if you could play baseball, you had a job in the mill. At one o'clock on the 
on the screen is the IOCO baseball team. That IOCO was the acronym for Imperial Oil Company. And you notice the one black player, player in the back row? Uh, those are what they call ringers. And they would bring in ringers from the United States so their mill would win the tournament. Uh, at the five o'clock point is the Fort Moody team, probably the Flavel Cedar being represented there. Uh, and they played on the Fort Moody Elementary School grounds right on St. John Street, which is still there today. A very short field and lots of home runs out onto St. John Street. <laughs> At the seven o'clock position is the Hammond Cedar Mill. Uh, also big competitors, big mills. And of course, the biggest mill in the British Empire at that time was Fraser Mills. And you can see the Milltown houses on King Edward Street uh, in the background. That player at home plate was standing on the soccer fields of Mackin Park as we know it today. The first bowling green, it was in Ioko, and there it is in the 30s. And you can see up there the Ioko baseball field where Fraser Mills would come and play. That Catholic church is no longer there, but just to the right of that Catholic church is the Ioko Elementary School. And in East Coquitlam, Minicata Farm and the Lieutenant Governor's summer residence hosted a lot of polo games. And in Coquitlam generally and in the Tri-Cities, you can see soccer uh, was being introduced by the English and Scottish immigrants. So there's the IOCO, the Imperial Oil Team in 1934. Oops, I'm locking it up again. Uh, the Dirty Thirties, uh, the Premier at the time, Premier Petullo, in the circa 1934, recognized the unemployment that was before them, thousands of young men out of work and women, and so he established the Provincial Recreation Program, Pro-Rec. Uh, and in the left-hand picture, you can see the p e form packed to the gunnels with women demonstrating their calisthenic skills and the bleachers full of spectators. Coquitlam had a pro-rec class in the Coquitlam High School at Austin and Nelson. There were classes in Port Coquitlam and another center in Port Moody and Ioko. Uh, the vaulting box, uh, a great stride vault being done over the high box at a demonstration. And at uh, one o'clock on the screen, you can see the Marine Building in Vancouver in the background and two pro-rec instructors demonstrating a pitch and toss uh, back somersault. Then came the 40s, the war years. And marching down 8th Street went not only a bunch of troops, but the coaches, officials for many of the sports and athletic programs throughout our area. And the Coquitlam High School, now the site of the John B. Pub, also suffered. And these kids in their high school years in the late part of the war, uh, when they were back in grade nine or 10, uh, provided their own leadership by and large, but their own leadership was good enough to get them into the BC High School basketball tournament uh, as, as contestants, which is quite an accomplishment. The playing fields on school grounds was, they were not bad, they were terrible. Uh, and here you can see uh, Ivan Merkel uh, trying a high jump, and Danny Doyle tells me, because Danny Doyle was a graduate of that school, uh, the kids had to use picks and shovels to dig their own jumping pits back then and ask the industrial arts teacher to make them a bat to play baseball. But in Blue Mountain Park after the war, Blue Mountain Park was the sinusure of activity, the center of activity, and here it is with May Days. And after the war, the Millardville Athletic Organization really took hold and baseball became a big thing. No, no teams in Coquitlam were ever referred to as Coquitlam teams after the war. Everything was Millardville. And here in Port Moody was the largest outdoor sea pool in our area. And you can see in the background to the left that column of smoke. That's the Jackson Mill. And to the right, the McNair Mill, the Shingle Mill. And here's a picture in the 60s of that same Rocky Point swimming pool, a sea pool. The de decade of the 50s saw baseball in a big way still growing, 
standing in the back row on the far right next to the coach is Charlie Filiatro, a former member of this council. There's young Charlie, oh, nice. his brother, uh, George. Yeah. George well, the other Filiatro was a better ball player, but uh, George was very active. And the newest minister, Adnax, and the uh, Salmon Billies would recruit our youth to play in their teams because we didn't have an arena anywhere in the Tri-City area. That didn't happen until 63. And on the right is Harrison Smith, one of the boys you saw in the high school picture uh, playing in the Man Cup for New Westminster, but a Coquitlam guy. 1951 saw the doors open on Kumalik High School. First gymnasium with showers, trained physical education teachers. In the special populations, Essendale, or now called Riverview Hospital, built and opened a wonderful recreation leisure center that still stands there today, perhaps underutilized. Uh, and these are some of the facilities that still stand there. Beautiful gymnasium auditorium, an elevator to take the equipment down into a downstairs storage area, bowling alleys, uh, six or eight physical education teachers. Uh, that's Don Cunnings is one of them in the background with a group of schizophrenic women where I was teaching them teamwork through physical activity. In 1955-54, the social credit government became the power in Victoria, uh, and the Liberals were out. And that's the year that Coquitlam started to establish its first recreation commission, and I was the part-time recreation commission, or part-time recreation director, standing just to the left of, of Betty Fry, the alderman. Uh, the other woman on the right-hand side is Mrs. Hickey, who Hickey Street is named after. She was a school board representative. And Rennie Gamash, you'll recognize in the far right corner. Uh, in the 50s, I was teaching physical education at the Ecole de Notre Dame de Lourdes and introduced gymnastics into Millardville. And the Millardville gymnast became quite renowned, won a number of Canadian championships. Neil Godden and Diane Conboy in the one o'clock position uh, represented Canada in the Pan American Games. And you can see we had some very strong young men with that iron cross in the bottom right hand corner. 1958 was a big centennial in British Columbia. The colony of Vancouver Island, the colony of British Columbia joined to form the colony of British Columbia. And that centennial resulted in Coquitlam's first outdoor swimming pool in Blue Mountain Park. No dressing rooms, uh, no heated water, no filters, no chlorinators, just a lot of kids and a lot of good feeling. The idea came from a track coach at Coma Lake High School. And in 59, here's brief Christmas opening uh, with the labor minister, uh, the Westwood Motorsport Track. And so history is a wonderful tool to connect the past with the present. And your staff and myself are currently with the city manager exploring, and I want to underline that word exploring, the possibility of using all of those huge windows or glazings or fenestrations in the new arena curling rink hallway as a possible hallway of history leading to the hallway of fame. And the possibility of putting these photographs digitally onto the glass. It's, it's just a thought at this point, it may not happen, but we're certainly exploring it. Likewise, uh, digital application of, of say that uh, hockey team from 1914 that won the Koi Cup uh, could be on uh, mm -hmm. an arena wall, or it could be on the back wall of the bleachers, and those are ideas that we are simply exploring. That's it, the show is over. I have to go off to Port Moody and give another presentation now that I'm being talked under the board of the Coquitlam Heritage Society. I hope you found it enjoyable and edifying, and I hope the audience has learned something from it, so thank you. Don, I gotta say, um, I worked with Don quite a few years ago uh, when he was, he'd already at that point been working with the city for a, an entire career and I, I, he has worked an awful lot, long time with the city and done a great deal of good work in this community and to bring 
in that kind of history into this chamber is with names like Gamache and Braconnier and, and Godin and Marchand and uh, many other people that I, that I, whose children I grew up with. It was really, really neat. And one of the other faces that I saw in, uh, or one of the names that we see on plaques around the city is actually the name McDonnell. And I kind of turned to Councillor McDonnell, who's activated his microphone, because I think he has some, some memories. Well, actually, I just want to thank you very much, Don. That was a trip down memory lane. I really appreciated that. And I'm sure everybody that uh, grew up in Coquitlam appreciates that. And especially the fact that uh, I understood every single word you said. There wasn't one long word in there that, that escaped me. And I, I really want to thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I miss that about you too. Um, and thank you very much. And, I, and particularly for the young people that are in the audience today, that's a neat history because we're looking to you now. We're passing the torch, so to speak, on to you. We saw yet last night uh, as Alexandre Bilodeau won the first gold medal in Canadian soil by a Canadian Olympian. And uh, we're going to see many more, and some of them are going to be perhaps people in, in this room. And it's with that uh, segue, I'll ask the clerk for item two. Thank you, Your Worship. Item two is our second presentation, and it involves the distribution of badges to the 10th Coquitlam Scouts. Oops, I gotta bring those. this way because there's a microphone here. Um, that'd be good. Okay. This scout troop has actually uh, come before council today at their request. Um, they've uh, spent some time learning about local government and uh, one of the uh, badges that you can earn is the Voyager Citizenship Award and I've been presented with a stack of them to hand out today to the to the scouts that are worthy of this award, and it's my honor to do so. And I'd like to uh, bring them up one at a time. Well, I guess all of it, but one at a time. We'll start with Jackie Cheng. Thank you very much. Oops, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> my my scout years are many years behind me, and I forgot about the the left hand shake. Um, <laughs> Gordon Liu. Teddy Morsh. Ryan Sharp. Emily Vandervelden. So I'm doing this in the wrong order, am I? Jenny Wang. Jeannie Lin. Stephen McCulloch. James Pang. Jerry Wen. And Leo Yamanaka Leclerc. Thank you very much for coming out today, and I thank you also for the inspiring torch relay that brought it down to us earlier. It's good to have you in. Thank you. Mr. Kirk. Thank you, Your Worship. Item three is our third and final presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Julie Rogers and Jackie Gordon Goring to come forward and some promotion and support for Tri-C's Helping Hades Babies event to be held on February 20th and 21st. Hi. Hello. I think in the last few weeks, we've all heard about the devastation in Haiti, and many of us were prompted to write a check. Um, but when I learned about what happened in Haiti, what I learned um, embarrassed me that I didn't know before is that conditions in Haiti before the earthquake were worse than bad, 
They're not just a poor little country. They were a devastated little country before they were devastated. In Haiti, before the earthquake, they had 200,000 orphans. There are estimates now that it's somewhere around 300,000 or 400,000. They're not sure because they haven't matched all the children up with any living family members. Before the earthquake, 75% of the people living in Haiti did not have access to clean water. Can you imagine what your jobs would be like if 75% of Coquitlam did not have access to clean water? It makes our, our water restrictions and our parking problems look really silly. We're, we're dumping clean water all over our lawns and complaining when we can't do it every day and these people would just be happy to have something clean to drink. Before the earthquake in Haiti, 50% of the children died before they turned five years old. We're talking about rebuilding Haiti and how it will take about 10 years to build, rebuild that little country. But how will they do that if half of their future generation dies before they've ever even had a chance to live? Because of what I learned, I was prompted to do more than just write a check. I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could do something physical, something specific for the children in Haiti so that we can help them to rebuild from their very roots? And I posted something on Facebook about, you know, maybe we should do something. Maybe we should, you know, send a whole bunch of baby stuff over there. And prompted by Jacqueline Goring, whom I didn't know, she said, yeah, actually you should. Do you wanna? And so we did. Uh, and today, in Coquitlam Center parking lot, a 40-foot shipping container was delivered. And it's really big. And it's really empty. So on February 20th and 21st, this Saturday and Sunday, we are inviting the entire Tri-City community to come out and help us fill it. We have a very specific list of what we're looking for. Diapers, powdered formula, dry cereal, infant Tylenol and children's Tylenol and children's vitamins. We contacted an organization called Heart to Heart Haiti and they're going to take charge of the container once we have filled it and they will ship it to Haiti and they have people there who will protect it and who will unload it and who will distribute it to orphanages in Haiti so that we can be sure that what we've donated goes to where we want it to go. We got our list of what's needed from the orphanages. We do want powdered formula. We know there's a problem with clean water over there, but these orphanages have found them enough clean water that they would like to make the formula themselves. So, we've taken care of all of the details and we have this really big shipping container, but what we need is for the Tri-City community to come together and lend us a hand in filling it up. We've um, had a little bit of press, we've been putting up signs, we've been calling on the business community, um, we've been to the Port Coquitlam City Council, we've been to Port Moody City Council, and now we are here before you to ask for a few little favors, easy things. If you are on Facebook, could you please join the event, Tri-Cities Helping Haiti's Babies? And could you please invite specifically all of your Facebook friends to join the event as well? When they join the event, they'll get all of the information on it on the event page. Also, tonight when I go home, I would like to send you each an email. I would like you to send that email to everybody on your email list and invite them to participate. If you would like to come out this weekend and volunteer, we would really like some extra volunteers. We could use a few more hands pack on the many, many boxes we're hoping to fill, 250 of them in this really, really big container. Um, also, I thought of something else that you could do to help, because there's always something else you could do. <laughs> you all know the people in this community. If you could each think of 10 people who work in this community and phone them, ask them, could you please, when you go to work this week, ask your entire office to fill up a box of things for Haiti and bring it on the weekend. If each of you calls 10 people and they get their entire offices to bring things to our container, it will be much easier to get it filled up. Also, when we were at Port Moody and Port Coquitlam City Hall, they said, sure, we could put out some bins, we could get the staff to fill them up, and actually, though they're usually very politically correct, both city councils said, you know, I'll bet we could raise way more than Coquitlam. We could really kick their butts. <laughs> <laughs> they did. 
I think we're going down it again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jackie has a little bit more to add. <laughs> Your Worship, um, councillors and um, guests. I just wanted to bring to your attention one special thing that I found out. Um, Julie was tasked with the promotion and getting the information out to the community. She gave me the job of finding the organization. There is a young woman who was actually featured in the Tri-City News, and her name is Rebecca Larkin. She is a Centennial graduate. Um, she went to Centennial. Um, both Julie and I went to Centennial as well, although we didn't know that at the time. But I wanted to tell you how impressed I was with this young woman um, because she gave selflessly. What attracted me to her was her blog, and she said, and she stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with an armed forces officer and says, come and help me, help my babies. She has 110 children in her children's home. Before the earthquake, there was 450 children attending their school, which had a feeding program. As of Tuesday last week, there are 600 people from her community living in her front yard, and she is helping to feed them. There's more information if you want to hear about it. I would ask you to go to her website, uh, rebeccalarkin.blogspot.com, and I hope that you will hear from her heart. Um, we're speaking on her behalf here. Um, the children are brought up in a family environment and educated through to college or trade school, and they are the future of their community. We would just ask that you help us get that message out, and if you have any questions, there is a um, telephone number. Um, you can leave a message and we'll get back to you. Email us. It is in all the press. And I want to thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McDonnell. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Julie. That's a good idea to send out an email, um, <clears throat> um, and I will for sure direct them out to, to everyone I know. Um, that list that you talked about that uh, people could fill, mm -hmm. to, for, for, will that be attached to that? Yeah, yes, it, I'm going to put it on the email. It's also on the Facebook um, event page. Oh, for those of us that are yeah. challenged I know. by... That's why we do the email yeah. as well. We'll, do the email. Yeah. we'll give you a hard copy if you need. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is great. That's wonderful. You're Thank welcome. you very much. And um, your worship, I remember you saying something on Facebook of what else can Coquitlam do, and um, there is an orphanage to rebuild, and there is a school to rebuild in Guanguave, Haiti. Thank stay, you. Stay tuned. <laughs> I, I, before you go, I do want to thank you very much for coming, but I also want to um, mention something. On Saturday morning, I had the honor of, um, because everyone's in town for the Olympics, there was a breakfast uh, related to the Francophone community, and the Governor General, Mikhail Jean, was there. And I happened to mention to her um, this initiative, and she uh, almost cried. She was brought to tears. She was uh, really uh, inspired and wanted me, wanted me to pass on her thanks to you. She comes from Haiti, of course, and uh, she's been back and she's seen the devastation uh, in her own community from other disasters, and she knows the devastation that's in her community from this disaster. And we talked as well about the possibility of tackling a larger project as a community, uh, but she did want me to tell you that if you run out of orphanages that need, uh, with the diapers, uh, she has a few others that will need uh, those kinds of supplies. And so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We are thinking this might be our first annual Tri Cities helping Haiti's babies. Stay tuned. See you next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, those are the three presentations, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, item four, concerns the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, February 1st. Recommendations to approve those minutes. Move moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item 5 is the minutes of the public hearing held Monday, February 8th. Recommendations to approve those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor McDonnell. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 6 is the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, February 8th. Recommendations to approve those minutes. Moved Move by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Lynch. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 7 is our delegation. The delegation. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Doug Stead forward. He's here to speak on the Community Capital Fund Get Active Grant approval process. And there's a presentation which I will call up. Your Worship, Mr. Stead. Um, city mothers and fathers, 
uh, staff from Coquitlam, thank you very much for uh, accommodating me, especially uh, our mayor, uh, in putting up with my tenaciousness and coming before you today. Um, did, did we have a choice? <laughs> Go yes, right you did, but Go right it would have been Thank a long you. battle. Thank you. But anyways, uh, I uh, try not to engage in these things, but when I do engage, I tend not to ever disengage. And I wanted to talk to you about the uh, Coquitlam grant approval process and, um, and how it sort of sorted out. And um, basically, uh, this money came about from the, the casino coming to our community some years ago under uh, Mayor, Mayor Sikora's uh, leadership at the time. And I was part of the group that was fighting hard not to have the casino come to us because I was concerned about criminal activity that might follow it. And I was wrong. And the Boulevard Casino is a, is a wonderful addition to our community and uh, are very good corporate citizens. Um, but the money that was set aside uh, on the deal to let the community come here as my understanding as part of the opposition was, is that uh, this grant money that they provide to us was, uh, was to be used in a fashion, uh, as it's stated on the website in Coquitlam, uh, for nonprofit organizations and also, uh, you know, primarily to promote, promote uh, children and youth like our, our scouts and, uh, and recreational and active sports things. And this is taken right from your, uh, your website. So the source of the casino funds is, is uh, uh, over and above all of the taxes and fees and levies that, that this industry um, that came to our community employs our people pays the community. And the, they derive their funds not just from Coquitlam, but from all uh, people that take use of their uh, entertainment facility. Uh, I looked at, um, I came to this because of a scout troop in, in, uh, in um, northeast Coquitlam. And uh, they didn't get a, a, a request for funding. And I had a look at what you were doing with the money. And, uh, and, and it jumped out at me that, uh, that you're actually using it as a form of taxation. Uh, your 79% uh, of the money that went out last year uh, went uh, to basically infrastructure and maintenance of what should have been funded through proper budgeting and taxation of city budgeting. And not uh, 4%, four, four groups. Uh, uh, or five groups or four, whatever, I'm close. 11% of the 36 applications, 80% uh, of the cash went to basically funding stuff that doesn't meet the criteria as stated and as agreed to when it came to this thing. One of the groups that my wife and I uh, fund, and we fund a lot of little groups, uh, French Cubs in, in Millardville, uh, the Northeast Coquitlam Cubs, uh, and their group uh, uh, came to me and, and we gave them some money this year and they were telling us about their refusal to get a grant application, which seemed to have boiled down to uh, their having uh, kids from Port Coquitlam. Even though they operate out of Coquitlam and they're on the boundary and they rent a building from the city of Coquitlam, um, it's reportedly, and I'm not sure this is true, but that's the feeling that they have, is that they were taken off the list uh, to get money because they had uh, too many kids from Port Coquitlam. And as your worship uh, has a long and devout experience with the Coquitlam Scout Movement in particular, uh, that's sort of contrary to scouting's general principles of, of fairness and equality and all sorts of other good stuff. So when I come to my recommendations here. Um, I'd like you to stop uh, geographic bigotry in terms of how you fund different groups. Uh, I'd like you to budget your, uh, your infrastructure to come from taxation and uh, repair and maintenance not being used from the casino funds. Uh, and I'd like you to consider that you're in a conflict of interest yourself in administering this funds as you're pulled every which way from Sunday trying to meet budgetary requirements. And this is a nice, cool piece of cash that's really uh, like a, a becoming a slush fund. And I would suggest to you that perhaps what you should be thinking of doing is uh, taking $800,000 and giving 800 groups $1,000, or 400 groups $2,000. And because the future really is, as has been noted before me in presentations, sort of um, fortuitously, is the children. And uh, the next generations of children that are coming up are going to have a very, very hard time in this world even finding employment. And if we don't start investing in, in them in, in, uh, in much more serious ways, uh, their future isn't anywhere as bright as, as uh, mine and yours has been. So that's my two cents on this issue. I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to speak to you. Um, and um, if it's not too much trouble, maybe I could come back a time or two on some other issues I'd like to bring forward, seeing in my t retirement from, from multi-million dollar businesses, which is imminent, I'm trying not to get involved in things, but I keep looking at stuff and I think 
there's something I could add, but I just can't add it from a seat on your side of the bench. I just wouldn't be able to do what you do, but I appreciate what you do and for putting up with crazy people like me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you, Worship. Item 8 uh, concerns the minute of the Special Strategic Priorities Administration Protective Services meeting of January 30th. The recommendations that these minutes be received. Second. Move by Councillor Lentz, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, the first item of business arising out of that meeting concerns the strategic plan refinement and confirmation. The recommendations that Council confirm this 2009-11 strategic plan. Second. Moved by Councillor Rob uh, McDonnell, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Second item of business concerns business plan priorities. The recommendations that Council endorse the 2010 business plan priorities as amended. Moved by Councillor Askinson, second by Councillor Lynch. All in favor? Opposed? Period. Item 9 is the minutes of the Land Use and Economic Development Standing Committee meeting of February 8th. Recommendations to receive those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 10 is the minutes of the Engineering, Utilities and Environment Standing Committee meeting of February 8th. Recommendations to receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Lynch. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. First item of business arising out of that committee concerns a revised rate for gravel extraction. The recommendations that Council direct staff to, one, consult with the aggregate mining operators on an appropriate gravel extraction fee increase and report back to Council. Two, utilize the criteria described within the report uh, in recommending the gravel extraction fee. And three, review the extraction fee on a three-year cycle utilizing the criteria described within the report. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Second item of business concerns a local area service. It's at Surf Crescent and Tide Place. The recommendations that Council direct staff to formally petition these residents of Surf Crescent and Tide Place regarding the installation of concrete curb and gutter on each street. Recommendation. Moved by Councillor McDonnell, second by Councillor Lynch. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 11 is the minutes of the Recreation, Sports and Culture Standing Committee meeting of February 8th. Recommendations to receive those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, the item of business arising out of that committee concerns the Achimo Achievement Center. The recommendations that Council forward a letter to the Fraser Health Authority stating their strong support for continued funding of the Chimo program in Coquitlam, which is to be terminated at the end of January, and that the City is concerned about the health and wellness impact of, on the Chimo program participants with severe disabilities who are Coquitlam citizens, and should this excellent program cease to exist, and that a copy of this letter be sent to the Provincial Government. Second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, seconded by Councillor Asmundson. All in favour? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 12 is a bylaw for fourth and final reading. The subject is the City of Coquitlam Tree Management Bylaw Number 4091. Recommendations that Council give fourth and final reading to Bylaw 4091. Recommendation. Second. Moved by Councillor McDonnell, second by Councillor Asmundson. All in favor? Opposed? We have uh, Councillor Robinson opposed. The motion carries. Item 13 is the City of Coquitlam Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw Number 4100. Recommendations that Council give a fourth and final reading to Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw 4100. Second. Move by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor McDonnell. All in favour? Opposed? In favour. Carried unanimously. Apologies, uh, and went up. Uh, Councillor Robinson was opposed on the last item. Motion carries. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, final item, item or not final item? Item 14 is the City of Coquitlam Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw Amending Bylaw 4101. The recommendations that this bylaw 4101 be given fourth and final reading. Moved by Councillor McDonnell, second by Councillor Asmundson. Attempted to vote against it because the bylaw has the word bylaw in its title three times. 
part on the clerk as well. The motion before us. All in favor? Opposed? Councilor Robinson is opposed. The motion carries. Item 15 is a report of the city clerk. Uh, the subject concerns the appointment of the chief and deputy chief election officers. The recommendation is that Carrie Lohr be appointed chief election officer and that Lauren Houston be appointed deputy chief election officer for the 2010 by-election. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor Robinson. Um, this, this matter actually relates to a, um, uh, it flows out of the resignation of Councillor uh, Finn Donnelly, who was elected as a member of parliament uh, for New Westminster Coquitlam. Uh, council had asked uh, about uh, three weeks ago uh, for us to um, look into the possibility of uh, looking to the provincial government for a way to not spend about a quarter million dollars on a by-election uh, at, at a tough economic time. Um, council agreed on that and we went to the ministry. I have uh, to report right now that we yet, as yet haven't received a formal response from the ministry, although we now have a meeting scheduled for uh, this Friday. I, I, myself and one staff member will be uh, having a conversation with the deputy minister about this. The hope is that we will be able to make the case. Um, nonetheless, the report was to come back to this council meeting, and so pending pending the receipt of a response from the provincial government, a notice, uh, a motion to uh, uh, defer the matter till the next council meeting would be in order. Uh, what's council's pleasure? Make that motion. Second. Moved by Councillor McTennell, second by Councillor Reed to defer uh, until the next council meeting. All in favor of deferral. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We'll look at this at uh, March 1st uh, council meeting, uh, hopefully for the last time. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, perhaps it is in order that this uh, next item may be deferred as is dependent on the selection of the election date. It's moved by Councillor McDonnell, second by Councillor Robinson. The motion before us, or rather the item before us, the staff recommendation was to move a town hall meeting from the date that was originally chosen for the by-election. Uh, obviously, if the by-election, if we found a way to not uh, be required to have the by-election, then it would be uh, uh, perfectly fine to leave the town hall meeting where it is. The motion is to um, defer. So defer this decision until the March 1st, once the other decision comes back to council. All in favor of deferral? Opposed? That carries unanimously as well. Uh, that is the last formal item on this evening's agenda. Standing. Thank you very much. Moved by Councillor Askinson, second by Councillor Reed to adjourn. All in favor? Opposed? Carries. Council has a uh, procedure that permits uh, up to 15 minutes of question period uh, on agenda items. It's items that were on tonight's agenda. Uh, there are members of the audience who have any questions, primarily of staff, for clarification uh, about the uh, about tonight's agenda. Seeing none, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Okay, then come forward, please. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Baldazzi, 2566 Burien Drive, Coquitlam. Um, I have a question about the new tree bylaw that you did fourth and final reading for tonight. Um, I have a, just a couple of clarifying statements so that council remembers and so that our citizens understand what I'm as, asking. As you know, Elizabeth, you've asked questions lots of times and we've, we've always had to say that this isn't about um, making statements. You do have to ask a question. Yeah, but it's just explaining it. Um, the city ran a public input workshop on the tree bylaw June 25th 2008, there was a consultant's report and staff recommendations. Ms. Baldazzi, you, you've told us this before. We know this. Um, but not do, everybody you knows. To, you do have to ask. No, but you're ask, are you asking the question of everybody? Or you have to ask the question, please. Yeah, it's for clarifying. Um, so anyway, there was a, a, Ms. Baldazzi, a public please input ask workshop. Your well, on, on March 2nd, they promised that the public input Ms. Baldazzi, would be included. Please ask your question. And January 18th, I asked what public input was included into that and um, into the new draft and what you uh, uh, approved tonight. 
and there was no clear answer given. So my question again is the same question I had January 18th, which was, and you promised to answer uh, to me on January 18th, and it's about a month now, um, what part of the public input process, the workshop, um, and the consultant's report was put into this new tree bylaw? And so what part of it, and where was it put into the new tree bylaw? Because there was confusion last time, and I didn't get an answer. And then they said well, I, they'd get back Mr. to me. I believe the question was going to be answered by, by Mr. McIntyre. When we do consultation processes, we get consultation from lots of people, and that doesn't mean that everybody's input is included in the bylaw. It, everybody's input is taken into account when we draft the bylaw, certainly. But obviously, when we have some people demanding higher private property rights and some people demanding higher tree protection, uh, the bylaw can't encompass both of those, uh, but it does try to balance. I'm going to ask Mr. McIntyre to repeat his answer. Go ahead. Um, yes, thank you, Worship. And uh, um, I hadn't forgotten the questions um, dating back from last month. In fact, I approached uh, Ms. Baldazzi before the meeting just to uh, arrange to speak with her. Did have a chance to go back through the reports over the last year and a half. And um, it was actually set out in a report of uh, last January, January 13th, and I can show you after the meeting. There was, um, the, there was the consultant's report from the public workshop. There was, uh, in the staff report, sort of an overview summary of what was discussed and some of the items coming forward. As well, there was, there was um, a number of things that staff were recommending to be included in the updated streamlined bylaw. And those, um, Your Worship, very briefly were to uh, um, change or the two tree per year was changed to a calendar year, um, so within a 12-month period. Um, the suggestion again from the workshop, which was a suggestion, the second suggestion was to uh, protect replanted trees, and so those are included as protected trees now under the new bylaw. And the third was around the area of uh, providing uh, better information in public education around uh, tree, uh, tree resources, tree replanting and the like. And that too has been provided in the, uh, uh, in the guidelines that go with the new bylaw and on the city's website. So that very briefly was sort of the three key um, takeaways that staff brought forward for uh, inclusion in the new bylaw. Thank you very much. Could I get the consultant's report sent to me? Because you actually, I can't stay tonight, but if you can send me the consultant's report and what what uh, the public uh, basically had to say and what they wanted as well, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other, qu any other questions? Thank you all. Have a good evening.